Good morning, everybody. I'm Deb, I'm a grateful member of Al Anon. Grateful to be a member of this group, grateful to do music with you all. Such a wonderful place, and I miss you so, so much. But let me tell you, there's a little bit of hope out there, and let me tell you what that's in the form of, for me anyway. Maybe it will be for you. On December 21st, I look like I have a mustache, right? Um, <laughs> on December 21st, there's going to be a Christmas star out there. Maybe some of you have read about it, but Saturn and Jupiter, as you know, um, are out there doing their rounds, and they're going to come together the night of December 21st and um, make a very bright light in the sky, not like a star that twinkles, but a bright light that just stays there. And um, to me, it kind of feels like it's the Christmas star that the wise men followed. Who knows what astronomical phenomenon happened at that time, right? But anyway, so December 21st, look outside in the southwest part of your sky. Here's the moon. Look down and a little bit right, and there it will be, hopefully, if the sky is clear enough. So that gives me hope. We have to find hope in lots of ways, right? Um, one of the things that's very cool about this church is that Martha is continuing her prayer and meditation meeting via Zoom, held on Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. Um, this next meeting, again, will be this coming Wednesday, the 16th at 11 a.m. Let Brooklyn know if you need the Zoom number, and he'll hook you up with that. And another great opportunity is... Uh, jo Joanne Sylvander, who is a retired UCC minister and a member of our group here, um, and she's actually going to be singing today, woohoo, um, she is leading an Advent uh, meeting, and it's really kind of more of a meditation. She has a lot of wonderful poetry and music. I've been um, hooking on to that, and it's really wonderful. So again, if you want the Zoom number to that, contact Brooklyn, and so... Martha's is on Wednesday, um, and Joanne's is on Tuesdays. Finally, here's another really wonderful thing that's coming up. Uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, from 6.30 to 7, we want you to be driving your car right through our parking lot here because you're going to be getting some Christmas bags of joy. Some volunteers are getting together, and they're going to put some really cool stuff in a bag for you. I think there will be a teaser maybe next week of maybe what you're going to get. But um, So Christmas Eve, be looking forward to driving through the Recovery Church parking lot between 6.30 and 7. And if you want to take a couple of them and hand them out to your friends or other people that you think really need something, uh, members of our church that couldn't come, that would be awesome too. So um, with that, I'll pass, and we'll carry on with the service. Thank you. My name is Martha, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. It's so good to be here. Uh, today is the third Sunday of Advent, and we will light the third candle. The first candle was for hope, and the second one was for peace. And we're going to start over here. Hope, peace, and this light, we, we light the candle for love. And I'd like to just share with you a prayer that came to me in email this afternoon, but it was written by Victoria Safford for her congregation, and it fits so much how I feel about you all. She said, I am trying to write this prayer for you on schedule to boil down into words the love, the loneliness, and longing held within the walls here, ghosting through the halls. Your absence, friends, is louder even than the voices I remember or the music, the silent singing now in every corner of this house, made holy by your presence. It's filled with only light today, and in the evening, memories and hope. I'm trying to write this prayer for you on schedule between one meeting and the next, one text or email and the next, but corona time distorts the clock and calendar profoundly. 
The sun's already shifted from the wall of windows facing east, and I'm still waiting, staring at the trees you love, the cottonwood, those oaks, losing ground and wasting time. Or maybe this is biding time. As we are asked to do in Advent, in the gathering, quieting darkness before the return of the light, biding time and holding space, the space of time that holds within the hollow of its emptiness, the hopes and fears of all the years, and holds as well the whisper of a promise for all that's yet to come. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Christ did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Now let us sing together, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. kids. <laughs> I need a few kids right here. I'm really missing the children most of all because, of course, you give the best hugs. At any rate, I would like to share a little bit of a message with you today. I've been thinking about, well, I've been thinking about a couple of things. At Christmas time, there seems to be a lot of lists and a lot of recipes. And I wonder if you ever 
thought about the difference between like a list and a recipe. I mean, there's maybe a list of things for Santa and maybe a recipe of how to make cookies. Lists sometimes look like this. Like, here's a list of what it says in our Bible reading for later today. Here's a list. It says, number one, be happy. Rejoice. Number two, say your prayers. Talk to God. Number three, say thank you and please. Now, here's a recipe. It's a set of directions. This is a little different, but it also has numbers. First, it says you will need two slices of squishy white bread, a heaping tablespoon Jiffy peanut butter, and a heaping tablespoon of Welch's grape jelly. Then it gives the directions. The directions are in order. Number one, lay the bread side by side on the cutting board. Two, spread peanut butter on one slice of bread. Three, spread jelly on the other slice of bread. Four, join the top sides, this is tricky, top sides of the bread together. Slice and enjoy. <laughs> now, what would happen if you didn't realize that this recipe was in order? It was directions. You know, like a list, you could be happy, you could say your prayers, you could say thank you. It probably doesn't matter which one you do first, does it? But with this recipe, if you started in the wrong place, you might spread peanut butter on your counter and jelly on your counter and then stick the bread on top of all that. And then what would you have? A mess. <laughs> so. I think it's just, I'm sure you have lots of directions at school and lots of lists, but the best part of uh, the lists that God gives us is that the things that God asks us to do, it doesn't matter what order we do them in. We can, we can be thankful, we can be happy, we can pray, we can be quiet, um, and we can even ask hard questions, and, um, and, it, and we won't make any big messes. So I hope that you're making some lists of the things that make you feel happy and loved this Christmas. And I hope that you put yourselves on that list because we love you an awful lot at the Recovery Church. Good, Good morning, everyone. My name is Brooklyn and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, this is the time of the service where uh, we get together and we lift up some prayers. Um, so if you're watching at home, um, if there's anyone that's uh, on your mind or in your heart that you want to pray for, you can pray with us. We'll do a nice pause in between. So first, I'd like to lift up a prayer to the homeless, that they may have food and find shelter and feel God's love and protection. We lift up a prayer. Lord, in your mercy. For all that are ill or in pain, either physically or mentally, may they feel God's comfort. We lift up a prayer. Lord, in your mercy. For the alcoholic and addict that are still suffering, may they seek God's guidance. We lift up a prayer. Lord, in your mercy. And for those amazing doctors and nurses who have to be absolutely exhausted by this time, but they persevere, they keep going on, may they feel God's strength. We lift up a prayer. Lord, in your mercy. And for all the loved ones that we have lost, friends, family, or pets, and a special prayer for family and friends of Mike Wright, who passed away yesterday, may they feel God's compassion. We lift up a prayer. Lord, in your mercy. 
and for the people of our community. Um, with the holidays coming, some might feel alone, isolated. Please reach out. We're here for each other. Pick up a phone, send an email, text, call, and reach out to each other. It's important. We are all in this together. And with that, let us now join in with the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, harmony. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Good morning. My, my name is Bob, very grateful recovering alcoholic. Um, it's, I'm very grateful to be here this morning. And this is a program of honesty and I need to say that honestly, the last 10 months have been really hard. Um, <laughs> it's a challenge to, uh, to go through this. And I've been experiencing things that I really haven't experienced before, fear and anxiety and depression. And it's, it's, it's been a challenge and it's been a struggle. But as often is the case, God sent me an angel <laughs> and he sent me an angel in, in the person of Dick Rice, many of you who know, who a couple of weeks ago just called me out of the blue. And uh, I mean, it was wonderful to get to talk to him find out that he's doing well, he's getting, he's getting healthy again, and, and his life is good. And in this relatively short conversation he, we had, he shared something with me that um, struck me. And he had, he had said that he had contacted a, a group down in Iowa that he's been meeting with over Zoom, and, and he shared with them that uh, he used the expression, I, I really dislike the term COVID fatigue. And he said, because if I can experience COVID fatigue, then I can experience recovery fatigue. And, and it's too easy to give up. Well, after he said, I don't know really what he meant by what he said, but I had one of them epiphanies <laughs> where I heard what I needed to hear and I realized that, that I have been here before. Similar, not the same, but a similar place. Because 30 years ago, when I entered this journey of recovery, I had to change everything. I had to give up everything I knew, everything that was comfortable to me. I didn't want to go to meetings. I didn't want to read those books. I didn't want to read that corny crap that was on the walls of the AA rooms. And I sure as heck didn't want a higher power in my life. I didn't want, didn't think that I needed God in my life. And I went through and I did it. It was, for me at the time, it was the CDC recommendations. That, that was the program that I needed to follow. And my life changed. And the reason my life changed wasn't because I won the lottery or something like that and all of a sudden everything became good. But every day, a little bit at a time, just by doing the next right thing, I started to experience serenity and I started to experience joy. I can do this again. I don't like Zoom meetings. I wish you were all here. This isn't the way that I want it to be. This isn't the way any of us want it to be. But the program has taught me a couple things. One is to, to accept life on life's terms. 
The other is to take it a day at a time. And I can do that. I can do that. I can start to look for joy in places that I didn't before. I have a grand, two grandsons who just randomly uh, instant message me on, on Facebook and with some of the corniest, dumbest stuff because I can't be over there to hug them, but they stay in touch. A granddaughter who <laughs> texts out of the blue and, and it's just absolutely wonderful. I have heard so many people say, I love you to me, to other people. I, maybe I'm more aware of it today than I have been in the past, but when I hear that, I love you, that's every bit as good to me as a hug. When someone texts me and says, I love you, that's every bit as good as a hug. So, you know, all of that fear, all of that anxiety, all of that depression isn't gone, but it's going. If I just continue to focus on doing the next right thing and find the joy. I've been through this before. I can do this. And I, I hope you can too. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. You know, I, 30 years ago, I had no idea I'd be here. <laughs> Trust me, I had no idea that I'd be in this place at this time. Our, our lives take us in, in some strange places and this is something I get to experience. And, and I know that if I find the joy that's there, I will find that serenity that I've been missing. So thank you, Dick Rice. Thank you, and have, take care. Thank you, Bob, for sharing your epiphanies with us. Uh, we want to continue to thank you for sharing your gifts uh, financial support for this church. This is the time of the service that we would normally pass the hat. Uh, the basket and we'd be singing and we'd be smiling and we'd be enjoying the music and, and it's quiet here right now but we're so glad that we're able to do this. Uh, we've had a couple beautiful gifts come in that I want to make you aware of. Not sharing the names but we had two generous donors who were fortunate enough to share their fortune with us and uh, sent us over $12,500 for two people. So to them, God bless you. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we just ask you to give what you can. There are two ways to give. You can uh, send a check directly to the church uh, here at 253 State Street, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55107. Or you can go to our website, click on the big red heart, and that'll take you into a portion, a secure portion of our website where you can make a donation there. You can make a one-time donation or you can make it a recurring. That is your choice and we appreciate all that you do for us. And that's why we're able to continue to do this for all of us. So God bless.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to his friends in the, at the church in Thessalonia. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Well, if you were listening to the children's sermon, <laughs> I like lists. <laughs> How about you? I've always liked lists because they help me keep track of what's important. And the older I get, I like lists because they help me remember. When we read the pas this passage the other day, those of us planning worship liked this list from Paul. Short and to the point, we said, Sounds like marching orders. The next right thing, as Bob would say. Number one, rejoice always. Two, pray without ceasing. Three, give thanks in all circumstances. Four, hold fast to what is good. And five, abstain from evil. Pretty good. Some lists are directions. I would say this list is a set of directions, but I'm not sure you have to worry about doing it in the right order. Now, the 12 steps are a set of directions. If you follow them, they lead to a set of promises. It is good to work them in order, at least at first. I have heard more people say that they went to meetings for years uh, and, and kind of worked the steps, but it wasn't until they intentionally went through the whole process from one through 12 that they experienced the spiritual awakening. They are set up to unfold in a particular order, kind of like a recipe or directions to get from one place to another. After that, it isn't unusual to go back and focus on a particular step over and over. Some of us need to repeat some of the lessons more than others. Spiritual growth is dependent on taking that next right step and doing the next right thing. I saw what that looked like this week. A sister-in-law of mine has a brother who is an ER doc in California. He's really burned out at this point. He writes wonderful sort of stream of consciousness poetry after he's been with patients or lost patients or experienced something with, with a, another human being. He wrote one after a chance encounter this week and I'm going to read it to you because I think that's what it looks like to live as Paul directs. He says, I was at the gas station, you know that, that Valero one over on R and West Olive? I was filling up before heading west to Alameda to continue my rehab in my perpetual attempts to fix all of me, which seems to be a never-ending process with varying degrees of successes over the past six decades of getting closer to that ever elusive goalpost. Well, anyway, it was like midnight, and I stopped at the Valero gas station over on R and Olive, and I was rested up and had had a two hour nap beforehand and had had a good day. As people who know me, and those aren't a great many, would say, I rarely, if ever, admit to a good anything. But that day had been good. I had been to my friend Buster Hewlett's auction over in La Grande, down southeast of Merced, and had spent the day there. I love auctions. I really do. They are up there 
with pistachio ice cream and a dog licking my face. That good. I bought a few quilts and an oil painting and a few other things, but just love the whole affair. And it really is an affair for me. The sing-song of the auctioneers, the excitement, the chairs, my bidding number 99, and the whole smell of the country auction. Love it. And so I was gassing up before heading out to Merced. And being midnight, the town was dark, and the station was all brightly lit. And I got off my horse, my Honda Civic, and went to fill her up. And over there, along the back fence, there was a cart and a pile of boxes and stuff. Coming from Brooklyn, you look, he's from Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Coming from Brooklyn, you learn to survey your surroundings. I mean, I love everybody, but the desperate people are desperate. And I didn't immediately see the owner of the possessions. I think in Merced, there are maybe more homeless folk than folks with homes. At least it seems that way now. And then from behind the station house, I saw a fellow lighting a fire to some paper. And he walked over with a piece of paper in flames toward his possessions. I figured he was going to make a campfire of sorts, it being December, and a bit chilly even for the hot Central Valley. And I thought. I grabbed my wallet while my tank was filling and looked inside and took out a 10. Then I said no and grabbed the 20. Then I said, damn, and took both bills. I mean, well, I had had a nice day at a country auction. I can spare the darn 30 bucks. I walked over to the man. I'm no spring chicken. I mean, I know that walking up to a stranger at midnight in a Valero gas station in, a, in Merced may not be the smartest thing like ever, especially a homeless stranger. Sometimes no fault of their own. They have other issues like with mental health. Like, I mean, I'm not judging. I'm the last fellow to be talking about mental health. But if he took out a 12-inch knife and stabbed me in the neck, it'd be my own damn fault, I know. But I did, and I said, hi there. He didn't look up from his fire project, so I said it again, only louder. Still no answer, so I said, do you need some money? Yes, he said still not looking up. So I walked over and handed him the 30 bucks and I said, it's 30 bucks, Merry Christmas. And he said, thanks, and I turned and walked back to my car. Which was kind of dumb, it not being anywhere close to Christmas. I mean, it was December 6th and it would have made more sense saying Happy Immaculate Conception Day, which is today, and much nearer, my kids who work in the Diocese of Brooklyn have the day off. Um, it's like a national holiday in the Vatican world. But I felt like I had to say something, like some excuse why I gave him 30 bucks to explain it for both of us. And I went back and returned the hose to the pump. The station was blaring some really cool classical music. I mean, I almost wanted to just hang out and listen to that music for an hour. There was no one else around, it being midnight in little old Merced. But I thought that would be crazy, and I was already beginning to second guess my sanity. So I got onto my horse, my old blue Honda Civic, and turned on the gas. Then to my left, along the margin of the station, the homeless fellow was walking off into the cold night, alone. And he said something. I rolled down my window. Now, I'm no spring chicken. I mean, I'm from Brooklyn, and I kind of know you need to be really careful about rolling down your window at midnight at a deserted uh, Valero gas station with a homeless fella eight feet away. I mean, if he took out a gun and blew off my damn head, it'd be my own fault. I mean, I guess he'd be a little at fault, <laughs> but the lion's share of the fault would be my own. But I rolled down my window and I said, what? And he repeated it kind of soft and low. So I turned off my ignition, put the car in park, and got out. What's that, I asked? And he said, a neighbor nearby is worth much more than a brother far away. And I looked at him, and I had to catch myself. 
I mean, especially since my concussion in August, I tend to cry a bit more easily. And I didn't want to start crying or some crap like that. I think he and I were already questioning my sanity. And that's another thing I learned, working in ERs around the country. It often seems the patients with major issues like homelessness and drugs, mental health, were often 10 times smarter than I'd ever been. It just seems that way. And so I stood there a second, and then I said, hold on a minute, and I went back to my horse, my old blue Honda Civic, and grabbed my wallet in the divider part between the two front seats. I opened it and I took out all the rest of the cash I had in it. And I went back to the man and handed it to him. That's all the cash I got, I said. And he looked at me in the face. He was dark skinned and had the most beautiful blue eyes. He was worn and disheveled. I mean, I often am myself and I'm not homeless. And he said, here, take a dollar. As he reached over to give me a dollar, I can't take all your money, he said. You ought to have at least one dollar. But I said, no, thank you. And I said, I'm your brother nearby. What's your name, I asked him. Michael. I'm Tom. And I shook his gloved hand. That's what it looks like, seeing the humanity in every human being and letting them see it in you. Amen.
Now we come to the table where all are fed, where all are welcome, and where there's enough for everyone. This is a table of love and grace, forgiveness, and new life. This is, Christ offers this meal to satisfy the hungers and thirsts that no human thing can touch. Come in your brokenness. If you feel like you are not worthy, know that you will be the guest of honor. This is Jesus' way of saying, I forgive you, I love you, and I will never leave you. We do this in remembrance that on the last night of his life when he ate with his most beloved friends, he took the bread that was left on the table at the end of the meal, and he blessed it and gave it to them and said, This is my body given for you, my life broken open for you. I forgive you. He then picked up the cup and blessed it, gave it to his friends and said, this is my blood shed willingly for you because I love you. Then he said, every time you eat this bread or drink from this cup, remember me and in the remembrance I will never leave you. So Holy Spirit, pour out your blessing once again on this sacred meal. Bless us as we eat and drink that we may be transformed by your grace and set free to love without fear. Open our eyes to see you, your face in every stranger and to bring hope to those who have little. Amen. Let us pray. We do not have to be perfect or even good to come to this table, O oh Lord. We simply need to come as we are and to celebrate your power to change our lives. We know that we have fallen short of what we want to do. We trust only in your love. We rejoice that your love is so great that you invite us to come as guests, especially in our brokenness. Grant that we may receive this sacrament as a turning point in our lives. May we grow to be like you as you become the center of our living. Amen.
Thank you. Let us offer our thanks. We give you thanks, Lord, that you have given us the cup of joy and the bread of peace, which refresh and restore us to new life. We ask you to strengthen us through this gift of your love. Help us to accept one another and to not judge people who are not like us. Help us to keep in deep community love toward one another, in patience in the midst of the problems of life and in the hope of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives in our lives and with you through the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Now let us uh, join hands and hearts with one another uh, and close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.